Good morning. Um, yes, I am Harold Wilkin. Um, I'm the owner of Janie's Farm along with my nephew and my son. And um, while I was preparing for this, how many of you are real tech savvy in this, in this group? Um, anybody tech savvy? Any of you farmers out there know what happens when everything gets lost off of OneDrive? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> so anyway, um, we're gonna do the best we can here. Um, so um, I had a cultivator, my first cultivator after I uh, started transitioning, looked a little bit like that one in the corner. Um, actually, I was having flashbacks when Paul was speaking. Um, my first Moses, um, um, my first Moses experience was 2004, and I took an organic university with um, Klaus and Mary Howell Martins, and that's where I got convinced that I could do organics. Um, Klaus had a front mount cultivator. He put two shovels on 30 inch rows out at the edge of the uh, plants and then he pulled a, um, a rear mount cultivator behind with the three shovels. And I thought, I can do that. So I went home and that's what I did. And for the first, oh, um, let's see, first five, six years, that was my cultivation tool. I had a John Deere uh, FM uh, 830 cultivator on the front, just two shanks, and then uh, a rear mount eight, uh, RM830 on the back, and we cultivated a lot of acres. In fact, I liked that so well, I went out and bought a second one. How many of you have iron disease like I do? If one's good on our farm, if one's good, two's better, and three is necessary. So um, we, uh, let's see, we, um, I, I, I like Paul's comment. Man, I'm glad you went first. Um, brought back so many good memories. Um, but um, so I better go through my slides or I'll get lost here. Okay, you, can you all see this? Uh, that's what we're trying to avoid here. Uh, that's giant ragweed. Um, actually, we took on a farm uh, eight years ago uh, that. Um, I told the landlady, you're not gonna be happy with me and I'm not gonna be happy with you, so we'll give it a try. But uh, we did this one year on this farm. We tried to farm it and half of the corn uh, yield was uh, giant ragweed seed. Uh, so we ended up um, mowing it for five years. And after five years of keeping, uh, having it in a cover crop of, uh, um, of uh, red clover and timothy, keeping it mowed so nothing went to seed. We finally got it to where now it's clean. And um, so sometimes, you know, when you're, um, for, uh, when you face a challenge, you gotta do drastic majors, measures. And luckily the landlady understood. Uh, she even paid me to mow it for five years. And now we're getting a wonderful crop. But sometimes you just got to go, you know what, we just can't do this. And neither one of us wanted to go back to herbicides. Um, so uh, my first slide here is actually one. How many of you raised spring wheat? For those of you who raised spring wheat, that was the reason I bought an eye in Bach Harrow. 2015, we started talking about building a flour mill. I needed hard red spring wheat. So I went out to Farmer Ground Flower in New York. Tor Oshner is a real good friend of mine now. Um, and I said, you gotta tell me what I'm gonna do here. Well, he says the first thing you gotta do after you um, plant your hard red spring wheat is get your hair ready, because uh, that's gonna be your weed control. Now, how many of you can see a lot of dirt uh, behind the uh, harrow? and looked like I was a fool for being out there. Well, that's what I felt I was. I sent a picture of that to Tor and I said, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? He said, that's not aggressive enough. <laughs> a 
Oh, Lord. So I couldn't drive by this field for about four or five days and then finally started turning green. Well, uh, that has two, uh, that Einbach Hero has two purposes. And I don't care if it's an Einbach or whatever it is, but Tyne Harrow. Number one is we control. When it starts to warm up to where that uh, spring wheat looks good, you also got the white hair roots of the uh, foxtail. And if there's one thing you don't want to have is you don't want to have the foxtail take over your hard red spring wheat. So we actually do this twice a year. Once when it's about three inches tall and again when it's about seven, maybe eight. Anyway, uh, the other thing is, is it causes the wheat to tiller and it'll really mat out and uh, be thick if you can make that work. That's the only spring wheat slide I got. So here's an experiment that we did with a neighbor. Uh, if you look to the left, uh, that is a field of, uh, of uh, food grade soybeans. Uh, and that uh, was one that we did tillage on. And the other one was crimped weeds. And I begged him not to do that, but he went out in the spring, it got wet, it was late, and he crimped the weeds down, planted it. And I said, well, let us do an experiment. And, there's quite a difference there. So in our soil, with what we're doing, if you don't have a really good field of rye that you're going to roll down and, and uh, uh, have a mat for a cover crop, don't try to no-till beans. Um, this may be a little bit hard to see. Uh, it looked better uh, on the computer. Um, that is uh, actually freshly rotary hoed corn, um, and it was a night hoeing. Uh, I actually run the night shift sometimes, um, and we, uh, when we got a rotary hoe, we got a rotary hoe, and we've got two 40-footers. Uh, we can do about 300 acres a day if all the fields are in a near close area. Um, but um, that was a rotary hoeing at night. Now we rotary hoe uh, 24 to 36 hours or 48 hours after we plant. Now that seems like, boy, that's pretty close, but if you're watching the weather forecast and you got a rain coming in, you're better off to hit her and get her done than to wait until um, a week later and by that time uh, the green has already started and the foxtail is starting to take over your corn crop. Um, Paul talked about his weed, his weed burner. Well, um, I bought a weed burner way back in 2008 and used it wrong for three years in a row, put it in the back of the shed. Um, now, uh, it is a vital part of our weed control in our corn. And, um, we actually wait until the corn's about 18 inches tall. We go up underneath the uh, go up underneath the canopy. See, uh, that's a better picture. Again, we do a lot of stuff at night, which is kind of crazy. But uh, we are all on GPS, uh, sub inch. Um, it takes a lot of stress off of a person if he can watch the tool and not have to watch where he's going. Now, anybody out here got an egg bleeder? Sometimes it don't go in the place you want it to go. So, especially if you're uh, looking back and, and it kicks off, if you don't have the beeper on, uh, you can be four rows over before you know what hit you. Anyway, but it is a good tool, uh, GPS, if you can get it to work. I know there's some camera technology out there. We actually use a camera. Uh, we On our main uh, cultivator tractors, uh, we've got them mounted on the cultivator looking backwards. And the operator can sit right here, look at the camera, and see if he's wavered uh, side to side off the row. Um, now, <clears throat> the third tractor, which is one that Dad drives, 
has a twine string with a one inch washer on it and it hangs down and that's how I tell whether I'm on or off. But uh, looking forward, you can pretty well tell if you're in the right spot or not. But when you're cultivating um, two to three inch tall beans and you're going a mile, a mile and a half an hour, uh, it's pretty important because you're putting that dirt. Like Paul says, as long as you don't put it over the top of the plant, you're okay. But if you got your 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 trifoliate leaf coming out and uh, and it can see daylight, you're good, and that also tears out a lot of the or uh, covers up a lot of the weeds. So there's there is uh, a cornfield that's been burnt that is uh, probably I'm going to say five to six days later, and uh, and yes, after Dad had his first heart attack when Ross did this, um, I for I finally learned that hey, um, this is a necessary tool because we what we did was we added about 20 to 30 bushels of the acre to our corn yield because we always had a lot of grass in the row. It was always competition and we were doing 125 to 140 bushel and it moved us up about 25, 30 bushel the acre because we didn't have that competition in a row. And, you know, we got to look at, like on our farm, we got to look at everything as a three year system, okay? So what you do this year, or what you don't do this year, affects you for the next two years. And so it's very important that you think about that when you go, I'd rather go to the lake and boat today instead of cultivate. You're gonna affect two years more of your system. That's not a very good picture and I apologize, but that was a field that had been burnt. You can see the kind of brown leaves up there. Uh, by now it's about two foot, two and a half foot tall. And we went through with our um, uh, buffalo cultivator. So I'll, I'll, ta I'll talk a little bit right now about the equipment we have. Like I said, we started out with uh, John Deere cultivation equipment. Uh, yes, we had weeds that outgrew us in years where we had rainfall at the right, right time. So um, we have two Henniker cultivators. One has uh, cutaway discs on it, the other one doesn't. The one that doesn't have cutaway discs, we run that in the soybean field um, right after we harrow it. So we, uh, let's see, I think next slide should be, there you go. Um, we go out when the beans are about two inches, three inches tall, and we harrow, and depending on how we do the first time, uh, we'll harrow it a second time in two more days. But we've, we've now got two of those Ironbach harrows, and you can't go very fast, but they do a great job, and it's made a world of difference of the weeds in the row. Um, you know, when you're rotary hoeing, yeah, we've made two, three, four passes with a rotary hoe when we've had extensive grass, but this color, this uh, tine harrow, like I said, I'm, it doesn't matter which kind, um, you can set that tipped almost forward all the way to where it's pulling up the weeds and go slow and it'll take out grass that's that tall. And, and if, again, if it doesn't get it all, you come back the next day or two and hit it again. Um, I've got one from 1955 and I knew I was, I bought that in about 2005 um, when I was uh, transitioning to organic, everybody said, you ought to have a harrow. I went to a farm sale where a guy had a 24 footer that would do eight rows wide. And um, when I was loading that thing up, the owner come over to me and he says, I haven't used that thing in 50 years. I said, well, I'm an organic farmer and I'm gonna use it this summer. Um, the only thing about the old ones, the old tine heroes like that, didn't have enough tines on it. And so that one you would have to do two, three times. And 
it, it just um, it just didn't have the capacity that these do now. I'm sorry about my pictures. They looked about a lot better on the computer. Um, this is our Henniker. Uh, this is uh, our first cultivation of soybeans. Um, already, they'd already been tine weeded. Uh, and uh, then we came back a few days later with the cultivator. And what, what determines the difference between a hero and the cultivator is uh, if we've got giant ragweed, if we've got buttonweed, um, Cockerbur, any of those things start to come up, uh, we'll use the cultivator. Ah, weed zapper. This is the toy right here. 14,000 volts. You talk about the burner. I got, I, I got a story about the burner first, and then I'll go to this. So there's a place in Minnesota, and my son's got all the information I can't tell you right offhand, but you take them an old 16-row cultivator, and it will come back a weed burner. And maybe some of you guys have that information, who that is. I can't tell you right off. But anyway, we bought, uh, I bought a, a Oh, what it was an 85 John Deere 16 row. We never did use it for cultivating because we bought a, a, a better one. And uh, anyway, uh, so they took that up, brought it back as a weed burner. Yeah, first thing we did was burn the rubber tires off of it. Now, we've got these steel wheels uh, and they worked us pretty good, but that was not intentional. <laughs> that was a, that was a, um, uh, that's what happens when you have uh, fire uh, too close to your rubber tires. But uh, we almost caught one of the front tires on fire last year because a, a, um, one of the uh, jets, uh, the um, set screw turned loose and turned it towards the, uh, the uh, flotation tire out front. That was kind of fun. Um, anyway, weed zapper made a world, all the world a difference on our farm, uh, where we had um, where we had giant ragweed, uh, where we had um, water hemp, uh, where we had um, in late season foxtail that made it through the row. Uh, this thing would annihilate it. I mean, it um, uh, the water hemp. There's so much water in the plant. It acts, uh, the, the plants act as a ground from the electrical charge on the bar. How many of you guys have a weed zapper? Well, there's a few in here. What do you think of them? Give me a thumbs up if you like them. Okay. Well, so this, uh, actually what's happened is, is uh, we had one of those, like I told you, we have an iron disease, and so two was better. Uh, so one goes out on the road and does custom work, and it used to be all organic farmers. Well, now it's non-GMO organic soybean farmers, and we're the last step because nothing that the uh, nothing that the uh, fertilizer dealer sells is going to kill the water hemp when it's sticking out of the top of the beans. So. Um, but uh, you can see the lightning strike. I did catch that. Um, it does look like Godzilla in the, in the, at night. Again, we, we run that thing 24 hours a day sometimes. And uh, Frankenstein would be proud. Um, it, and it will reach out as much as a foot for um, uh, water hemp. Now the thing that it won't kill is buttonweeds have gone to see or start to put the pods on. Buttonweed has a deciduous or a, a woody stem, so they can't get they can't get a good ground. If you get them when they're small, good. If you can get them back where the beans are like like that, and you can get them, you're okay. But if they get tall enough, and I don't have a picture of it. Um, they get tall enough, they'll kink them, and they'll make them mad, 
and if you go over them about three times, uh, you might might burn them down, but they're still going to put seed on. The one thing I will no I did notice though is as I start breaking open pods of seeds, where we've been through with the weed zapper and the seeds are deformed, so I'm hoping that that will cut down on the amount of seed next year that we have to deal with. Um, two thoughts to you too. Um, our fields sometimes look horrible from the road. Horrible. Because when you're turning with cultivator or anything, you turn, you got wheel tracks, and if you've got duels on the front of your tractor, you, you know, you just uh, annihilate the the uh, end rows. So I've been trying to talk my son, and I think we're going to take one or two fields this year, and we're going to put 40 uh, feet of oats all the way around the field. Not all the way. We've got 20 foot border or 25 foot buffer strips already on the sides, but like next to the road, um, wherever we don't have a buffer strip. I think we're going to put 48 feet of oats because weeds gather there. There's compaction there. If you any of you got yield monitors, you never get the best yield off of your end rows, and it's just a good place for weeds to keep growing unless you have time to knock them out with a garden hoe. So um, my suggestion is even even though corn might be. Twelve to thirteen dollars, beans might be in their twenties or thirties. Um, for the long term of the farm, I I believe we ought to be taking the end rows and put them into uh, at least where the wheels turn. Uh, the next forty feet, fine and dandy, plant that, and you'll have spots coming through where you can't you know turn around, but on the end rows, it just gets beat up way too much. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is, is uh, we're on 40 foot centers with everything except for our tillage. And where those tractor tracks go year in, year out, that's where our buttonweed problem is. We'll have very few buttonweeds in the outside 24 rows between the uh, planter tracks or the tractor tracks. But where the tractor tracks are, I, I should have had a picture of that. I'll take one next year. But that's where our button weeds are. And I don't know how many of you guys have been around sustainable agriculture and, and um, organic for a long, long time. But there was a book out called Weeds and Why. And, and one of the things about a, a, a velvet leaf is it's a taproot. And it seems like it works really, really well to break up your compaction right where you drive. And so um, for those of you who um, maybe have experienced what I've experienced, uh, if we can figure out a way to not spend as much time on, on these uh, fields, uh, we're probably better off Hear that, or uh, maybe have to go through with an inline ripper where you drive. So, I'm going to leave you with this last slide no till someday. I can't wait until we can figure this out so you can do it year in and year out. Maybe you guys, maybe some of you guys have got a secret, but we did it three years ago, we had a beautiful. Um, stand. Um, I probably spent a month um, praying and hugging those beans to come out of the ground. But um, once they got out of there, uh, they looked pretty good. And, and the weed zapper did a good job. And uh, we got, I'm going to say 90% of the giant ragweed and, uh, and water hemp that was in that field. Um, but we're not in a position where we can afford to have disasters every other year or every third year. And so until we get this system figured out, uh, we're not gonna no-till on Janie's farm. 
partially because most all the grain that we raise, we try and raise food grain. So we can't have contamination. We got a flour mill, can't have wheat in your, can't have rye in your wheat. You know, um, uh, just a quick uh, story, um, sold corn to grain millers. Uh, back, I don't remember what year it is, but I think we got $15 a bushel for it. And um, it was, it was in a, that corn was in a field that I thought I would be a good guy, and um, my nephew and my uh, landlord were doing uh, grass-fed beef. So September 1st, we took an airplane, and we flew in rye, and it never rained, and it never rained. So when we harvested corn, first load of corn went to grain millers, and they sent it back, says you got wheat in it. Said can't have wheat in it. There's no way there's any wheat in it. So they sent me a sample, and sent me a picture. It was rye. When we seeded the rye into the corn with an airplane, it stuck in the world, never had any rain to, to, to work it out. And so we had to bring back three semi loads of $15 corn and run through a rotary screen. But when you're talking about contamination, these food grade buyers, if you show up with, with anything in this grain, uh, they're gonna take it for feed. So you gotta be careful what you're raising. If you're gonna raise it for, food, for feed for animals, you've got a whole lot more leverage uh, with, uh, with what you're uh, able to raise. So that's, that's me. Uh, any questions?